so um, just to kind of give you a background, this is new for us. So first, Ken and Bill both, thank you very much for joining us. Um, our Government Affairs Committee is a lot more active than it was just a few years ago. So um, where we used to have um, live Meet the Candidate forums, um, we have moved into a virtual world. And what we have decided after we played around a little bit with this last year, it works better for us to come up with um, some questions and have small gatherings like this do short recordings so that people can get to know you both better um, within their elected, within um, the races that they're interested in learning about. So um, uh, first, let me back up and also reiterate that the chamber is not a partisan organization. We're nonpartisan. Uh, we do not have a PAC, so there's no um, money in this race, so to speak. Um, however, um, being a strong um, advocacy organization, uh, the board may choose to endorse candidates. They may not. Um, they may choose to um, uh, publicize your scores um, based on the questions that are given today. They may not. So, um, you know, they have not been really active in that way in the past. They are moving more and more towards um, really wanting to, to take that next step. So what's going to happen today is Rob's going to ask you eight questions. You'll each have two minutes to respond. Uh, Joan's going to be our timekeeper, and if you two want to use your phones to just kind of set your own timers, feel free, because we did find that visual is very helpful for people. So um, Joan's going to be doing the same thing. We had a technical issue last Friday, so we're not going to do the screen share of the timer, because we're not sure what happened, but we lost audio when we did that. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for us to be able to hear your responses. So we'll work around the time tracking. Um, and then what we'll do is um, your, um, the video will go to our Government Affairs Committee. Um, they will make recommendations to the board. Um, the board can then choose if they want to put together a um, endorsement panel to, to score. And if they do, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, so our board meets Friday. So we'll know if they choose to move forward with any sort of endorsements or, get, or um, scoring. They might go ahead and score you and then say, gosh, you both did great. We're just, we're not going to endorse. We're not going to do anything. We're going to wish you both well in the race. We're not going to publish scores or anything. Again, very new, very up to them, but I just want you to know. So you aren't waiting, bated breath, or you have unrealistic expectations of what the board may or may not do. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right, so with that, I think, Rob, I've covered most of my part. Can I ask you a quick question? Absolutely, Ken. If, so Joan will be keeping time. Is she going to give any indication to us that we're close to the two minutes? I yeah. will tell you at 15 seconds. Okay. Okay. So you'll, you'll kind of chime in that we have 15 seconds left. Is that right? Right. I'll tell, okay. And I'll tell you when it's up. And, and if you still are going on, then Kathy <laughs> has the power to mute you. <laughs> you're going to give us the hook, huh? <laughs> yeah, give you the, you're going to do the hook. That's okay. right. It's, yeah, only, okay. it's only fair to do it that way. I agree. Joan, Joan, do you have a reaction button on the right? Because you could just hit the reaction button for a thumbs up, and that would be the... So you're going to verbally uh, cut in, or you have a little 15-second sign you hold up, or what? I'm going to verbally cut in. I mean, it's kind of fun. It's kind of hard to take my phone and do this to you. So, um, um, so I, I mean, I can tell you at, at 30 seconds too, it's up to you, but my thought was 15 seconds. Uh, or Joan, could you just put your thumb up like that and that would give them a notice? Of 30 sec, of 15 seconds? Yeah. Um, I I'm happy to do however you guys are comfortable with. I know Bill and I, I think have, we've done so many of these. We've done it all kinds of different ways. That's, uh, that's why I just wanted to clarify. It, it might be uh, good just to not cut them off on the voice. That's the only reason I say that. Well, yeah, but if I do this, they might not see it. So I, <laughs> I don't know what. Oh, yeah. You know. If you hold it in front of you, they'll see it. Okay. Yeah. If but, that's what you guys want, then I'll just put my. We'll give it, we'll give it a try. Anything. So. No, so, it's only, um, we're only going to do this one way from now on. We're not going to change. So um, I, I will put my thumb up at 15 seconds, and then uh, 
I will tell you that time's up and Kathy will be able to um, mute you. Perfect, okay. perfect. So, so welcome Bill and Ken. Um, are we gonna, are we gonna alternate questions back and forth? Rob's yeah. gonna take it from here and explain how we're gonna start and go back and All forth, right. yes. Yeah, so hey, hi Ken and Bill. Um, I'm Rob Young, I'm, I'm with the Government Affairs Committee. Uh, I'm on the East King Legislative Coalition of 12 Chambers as well. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna moderate the session here with uh, eight questions. Um, and this is going to get recorded, uh, knock on wood here, and uh, the recording will be able to be, you'll be able to use it. Um, and we're going to, we want to broadcast it to our chamber members as well. And if anybody wants to broadcast it out to their own membership to let people know so they'll be more educated voters, voters and things like that, that's kind of the hope of the whole thing. And we, we're going to kind of continually uh, roll with this. So to get started, um, we're gonna do something fun. I'm gonna take this coin and I'm gonna flip it to see who goes first. And we're gonna alternate the questions of who starts. It's, it's not a, you know, we thought about this. It's not really um, overly critical, but it is just kind of be fair to, um, you know, that kind of thing. So hang on a second. I'm gonna to try to catch it last time I didn't. So, okay, we got it and I lost it. And hold on a second. <laughs> Oh, and he just had surgery, so let's go and find it. some slack. <laughs> oh, got it, got Today. it. Okay, perfect. So, um, Bill, we're going to start. I'm going to make a note on my sheet here. So, uh, Bill, we're going to start the first question with you, and then I'll make some other notes here, too. Um, okay, so here we go. And, and it's going to be, we want to make this kind of fun as best we can, but um, here we go. So, please take... Uh, two minutes to share, Bill, why you're running for this office and the two top things you're, you're, you want your constituents to know about you as a candidate that makes you uniquely qualified for the position. Um, thank you, Rob. Yeah. Well, to start, um, I have always been involved in my community. Just from, from my, when I started as a kid. Um, wherever I lived, a lot of small towns, always involved. When I got into Issaquah, I actually, it's the first time I lived in city limits in a long time, and I got involved in the commissions. And uh, some of you know, I've worked with some of you on them. I got on the Economic Vitality Commission, and then the Planning and Policy Commission with some of you, and also the uh, Human Services Commission. So I've always just been involved in working with my community because I care. Right? And so people pushed me after all that three commissions, they said, you should be on the city council. So I decided to run. And that was because people pushed me into it. I didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I should run for elected office. People had to work hard to push me to get into it. And then they said, after I was on city council for three years, they said, hey, you should, you should run for state rep because you work hard and you do a really good job. I said, okay, so I worked for that too. And what I found is I love the legislative process. It is not, a, you know, I know what to do process. It's a legislative process, which means you have to bring people together. In our case, 147 people I have to get some kind of agreement with to get something passed. That's a lot of hard work. And I love it. I listen to people and I work hard. Those are the two things I do most of all. I listen and I work hard. And I'll bring all this experience with me from my uh, professional background in natural resource management and transportation. And more so is not just what I say here, but what others have said for me. I have endorsements that is a resounding endorsement from the Seattle Times as the most qualified candidate here. I have teachers, firefighters, uh, elected officials, mayors, city council folks behind me, environmental groups, retirees. Look at what everybody says about why I should be continue to be your state representative. And uh, I just wanna continue to do that work for you. We're gonna have a hard time this next year and, and all the stuff we have to work on. And I wanna help represent you well here. Thank you. Time's up, thank you. Rob, you're thank, on mute. Thank you, Bill, for that. So, Ken, would you like me to repeat the question, or do you got it? No, no, no. I, I, I think I'm ready to go if you are. <laughs> oh, you bet. Go ahead. Great. Well, first of all, thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting me here. Um, this is a, a real important election, and I think it's a big election about the future. And, you know, I am not a politician. I'm a businessman. I own two uh, aviation-related companies that I've run for over 13 years. Um, so I have a deep background in the aviation and aerospace industry. 
Um, I've also done a lot of business overseas. I've run projects in Spain and China. I've done a lot of work with companies in Ireland. And so I really kind of bring a, a, a global perspective and understand the importance of trade to the state. And I, I really got kind of inspired to run for this position um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I, I think that, that the voters should always have a choice in any race. Uh, and I was a little concerned that that bill might stand for election unopposed. Um, so that was kind of one part of it. The other part is, is I do think I can bring a different perspective to Olympia, something that is a little bit fresher, something that is not the politics of the past, because I don't think that that's going to serve us well for the future. And I think we're in danger of slipping to such an overwhelming Democrat majority in Olympia that a lot of voices are going to be drowned out and a lot of common sense policies that could help small businesses and help the fifth district, which tends to be kind of a little bit of a 50 50 district. A lot of those things are never going to make it never going to be heard. So I think it's time to determine what direction we want to go into the future. And if we want to have a, a overwhelming Democrat majority that seems in favor of taxation and, and large government budgets and more local control, or if we want to go into a, a different direction where we're responsive to the individuals, to businesses, and to kind of the will of the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, for the second one, Ken, I'm going to have you start. Um, and I think you answered part of this already, but I'll say it the way it is. Um, do you have business experience or are you an owner of a business? And please describe and include the largest budget and largest number of employees that you've managed in your career. Sure, thanks. Um, I'm happy to expound on that. So I, I own two aviation related companies. One is Global Aircraft Services. Uh, I've owned that since 2007. That is a, a international company that specializes in managing the movement of commercial aircraft around the world, mainly for foreign airlines and leasing companies. I also own another company called Safe Air Media. And we're the folks that design and print those safety cards that are in the seat back pockets when you fly on airplanes. So we do Hawaiian Airlines, we do the corporate fleet for Vulcan, for Starbucks, and for a number of other um, charter companies and corporations. These are small businesses, so we've employed anywhere from uh, seven to, to just two or three people in those. Prior to operating my businesses, I've worked in the airline business for quite a while. I worked for Virgin Atlantic Airways for Richard Branson's company, where I was in charge of a $50 million budget uh, to oversee all of the North American airports for the contracts, for real estate, for um, uh, ground handling services, and any contract that touched an airport, I was, I was in charge of that. I've also started a commuter airline before and have raised money from private investors to do that, uh, as well as I've worked in finance and in marketing. And I think the biggest staff that I've been in charge of has probably been about uh, 35 people um, at the small airline that I've, I've helped run. So I have a really diverse background, except I've never flown the airplanes or turned wrenches. So I can't, I can't tell you how to fly or how to fix your airplane, but I, again, <laughs> I think the aerospace component is going to be really important in the legislature going forward, especially because of what's going on with Boeing and that we may uh, potentially lose the 787 and all the jobs that go along with it. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Ken. Um, hey, Bill, uh, to you. Great. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, I have an interesting situation. I grew up <clears throat> excuse me, um, with a mom who ran her own business for 62 years. I don't know how many people can say they ran their own business for 62 years. But as a kid, every Sunday, she would be doing the books and writing the payroll checks for Monday morning. And I watched her do that. And I know what it's about because some Sundays were easier than others. As you know, that happens in business, right? And so I had that feeling of that entrepreneur, that small business thing from the time I was a kid. Now, right now, I'm a member of the Isquad Chamber with all you. And prior to that, when I lived in Snoqualmie Valley, I was a member of the Snoqualmie Valley Chamber. So I have been a public servant all my life in many ways, but I've also been an entrepreneur. I've always got a business going of some sort. So I've had rental business. I've been a landlord. I've had dance studios. I've had a consulting business. I've had woodworking shop. Always in some sort of part of the business world, 
to try to be another part of that community and let my creativity out the way that it, uh, it, it uh, you know, just needs to get out and reach into the public. And I love to this day when knocking on doors and knocking on somebody's door and I said, hey, you taught me dance classes about 10, 15 years ago. Oh, wow, that's really cool. That's part of the community. Businesses are, these small businesses are part of the community. They make up our, these small cities out here in our district. They are our friends and our neighbors. And that community is what has to come together to keep everything going well. That's one of the reasons why I got on the Economic Vitality Commission well, before I even got on the city council, because I know that is a critical piece. And what can we do to make uh, the economy more vital? That's the part I want to look at, vitality of our economy and keeping that running. So always been a part of it and always will be. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, Bill, back to you. Um, can you tell us what qualifications and leadership skills you would bring to the legislature if elected in this round? Great, um, thank you. And, and yes, it, I believe experience counts. And that's one thing I can tell you that I have. As I mentioned, all these years on, I don't know, years on city commissions, three years on the city council and two years currently as your state representative. So I've got the experience already, <clears throat> excuse me, of doing the job. And again, as I say, the legislature is not something where I can say, I got the idea, I'm gonna make this happen. It doesn't happen that way. It takes 147 people plus the signature of the governor to make something happen. So I get people to work together. I talk about carbon sequestration, my biggest bill this last session. <clears throat> Everybody knows anything about carbon. It's always controversial. It's always partisan. Well, I sat down and got everybody to work together. We sat at the table, we knocked heads, we worked through it all. And I got timber landowners in with environmental groups and all these people to get to a solution that's gonna work for everybody to take advantage of our great forest and agricultural lands we have in this state. We can use these to help our environment build what we need to take care of stuff. How do we do that? We got together and we passed that with a unanimous vote in the house. No, how, how often do you think there's a unanimous vote in the house with our two political parties separated to the extremes of both of them to, I brought them all together for a unanimous vote on carbon. That is unheard of. That's the kind of leadership I will bring working together. Another mention is the Association of Washington Cities gave me their city champion award because I work with all seven cities in our, in our district to bring them together. I sit down with them as I have with the chamber and say, what are your legislative priorities for the next session? And you lay them out, you explain them to us, and then we go down there and we work on them together. So that's how we work together. That's the leadership I provide and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Ken, over to you. Yeah, I mean, again, I you know, I kind of lean back on, you know, my private sector experience and that that's something that I think, especially going forward, is really needed in the legislature. Um, as, as we try to reopen the economy and get people back to work, we need somebody that has kind of been in the, in the trenches and understands the friction in the economy that can prevent us from kind of growing our way out of this budget deficit, because that's probably going to be the only way that we do it. Uh, again, I started a number of businesses. Uh, Global Aircraft Services was an Inc. 5000 company in 2009. Uh, I have uh, supervised a number of employees and, and including diverse groups of employees. When, when I was a uh, executive at Virgin Atlantic, I was on the East Coast and I was having to work with people whose English was a second language for them, who came from varying backgrounds. And, and was able to kind of pull these, these project teams together in order to deliver results for my employer and for our customers. I, I don't think the uh, learning curve is, is going to be that steep as a legislature, as a legislator. Um, I mean, Representative Ramos has been there for two years. He sponsored six bills. Uh, and in the 1300 votes he takes, he votes 98% of the time with his party. So, you know, bring, bringing people together is, again, it's easy when you have a super majority in the, in the legislature. I want to come in and talk about what are common sense ideas we can do to get this economy going, whether it be relaxing some licensing requirements, whether it be talking about B&O tax holidays, things that are going to really make a difference to the many small businesses, get people back to work so we can avoid having to have these these 
round and round discussions about how we're going to c cover this budget hole with taxes. So uh, again, I'm going to fall back on my uh, my time as a businessman, a business owner, and somebody that's worked across a lot of cross-functional teams to bring that experience to Olympia. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, question number four, uh, Ken, to you. Um, in, the op in your observation of the important work in Olympia, what key issues would you focus on in your first year if elected? And this is kind of a critical thing based, based on where we are in the economy, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the, the issues have kind of, I think, been put before us and, and I'm sure, and you know, again, Bill and I have done these forums quite a bit and I, I think we, we tend to agree at what the challenges are ahead. I mean, number one, we have a big budget deficit that we need to figure out a way how we're going to provide the, the necessary government services like K through 12 education and you know, healthcare and the, the required things and where we're gonna be able to find areas that unfortunately we're gonna to have to look at at some cutbacks, whether it be on personnel and administrative agencies or you know, some post-secondary education cuts that are gonna to have to be made. Um, that's probably gonna be job number one. And in, and in concert with that, figuring out how we promote policies to get the economy back going. And that's gonna be, you know, maybe considering do we, uh, do we take a, a little bit of a break from regulating businesses in terms of non-essential regulation so that we have time to catch our breath and start focusing on serving our markets again. Um, can we do something with, again, with, with tax holidays or even a sales tax holiday to give our small businesses some chances to, uh, you know, to kind of kind of get that revenue stream coming in again, to give them kind of the fuel that they need to start moving forward. So I think the budget and I think getting the economy back going again, uh, and in concert with that, all the other things that go into it, whether it be getting kids back in the classroom, uh, whether it, it, it be looking at uh, childcare issues, all of the things that surround that, I think are gonna become the primary focus and should be the primary focus uh, of the legislature going forward as soon as we uh, get to Olympia in January. All right, thank you, Ken. Uh, Bill, to you. Hey, thank you, Rob. Well, I see uh, our, our state right now, our country as a whole as well. We, we're in, we have four crises going on at once. The first one is obvious our health crisis with COVID. Okay? but that has spurned our economic crisis as well, right? Now, that has also unveiled our social justice crisis. And on top of all that, we still have our environmental climate change crisis. And if you don't believe me, you just look at the color of the air out there today and for the last week and what's been happening. We have an environmental crisis we have to work on as well. So how do we get there? we have to work together and we have to follow protocols. We know enough now, not everything, but we know enough to know that if people wear masks and they try to keep social distance as much as possible, things will get better. We will get this health crisis under control. That's the key, getting the health crisis under control. Then we can work on the economic crisis. We can get those folks back to work. We can get everything happening once the safety of our citizens is taken care of. So we must get Kate, our businesses being able to weather the storm to get to that point. And we're getting there. I just heard today that we've hit uh, numbers for two weeks that are gonna look at considering opening up to the next level. So what we're doing is working. We're working together and we're getting there, but it takes experience to get this job done. One of the things I'm working on along with all that is as we work on our social justice and environmental issues is transportation. It was the number one issue before COVID hit. And I'm on the transportation uh, committee. I'm working on the transportation package, which is to bring new uh, uh, projects and revenue into how do we take care of our transportation infrastructure. And, and I am nicknamed Mr. Highway 18 because I have made sure that Highway 18, we've got the interchange uh, funded. We have to get the four lanes over Tiger Mountain funded. That is number one in our package already because I've worked so hard to get it there that that's no longer a question. It's just a part of the problem. Time's up. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so, Bill, you're up. Um, this is the longest question we have, so um, bear with me. Um, the Issaquah Chamber is a catalyst and a champion for the business community. Uh, Washington's economic competitiveness and the vitality of any community is reliant on healthy businesses of all sizes. 
please share with us your opinion of where a decision in the legislature this past year, number one, supported businesses, and number two, had a negative impact on businesses. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we were in the legislature when COVID first started hitting Washington State, and we were not one of the, we were the first state where we thought we, it came to us. It was just happening then. We didn't know what it was going to be, where it was going to go, but we took the bold step before we left in closed session was to set aside $225 million to work towards COVID relief in, in a way that would be necessary once we were gone. So there's a bold step of taking forward, stepping forward saying, we know that we're gonna need, have some needs, let's make sure some money's there so we can do it. That's, that's one of the ways we did it, quick, swift action. Now, the situation has grown obviously even bigger than we anticipated and, and it's gonna keep the, uh, being there. Where we have times are hard, we're gonna keep working through there. But guess what? Our state has been named the best state to work in during time of COVID, okay? So we're coming back stronger and better than the rest of the country. Why? Because we took some of the hard steps. We're working as we're doing that masking. So we are now one of the best states to work in in the country. So that's getting our workers back. Everybody wants to work. Everybody wants to live their life. They want to do this. So all we have to do is provide the safe way for them to do that. And and we'll have to continue to do that. We have to continue educating our kids and our adults in our community colleges and, and, uh, and uh, universities so they're ready for those jobs that the business community wants. So working together, take, uh, seeing what's needed and taking action as quickly as you can. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, Ken, uh, are you good with that question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Okay, okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I guess the thing is you got to look to the general kind of trajectory of the legislature when it comes to business, but, you know, to point to a couple of items, I mean, one thing that I think that was, was really good and it's, it's kind of in my wheelhouse. And I think that's why I would choose to highlight it here was, was the passage of uh, Senate bill 6068. And that was the renewal of a, of a tax break for people that are bringing their, their large private airplane into the state of Washington for repairs or modification. This was, uh, this was something that had been passed earlier and went into effect in 2014. It supports a number of aerospace cluster jobs. It helps uh, a lot of companies that I work with like Greenpoint Technologies in Kirkland, ATS up in Everett, and they have a big uh, VIP jet modification facility in Moses Lake. This enables those companies to maintain competitiveness against other states for what tends to be, you know, millions of dollars worth of, of revenue and then corresponding employment. Um, unfortunately, Representative Ramos was one of six people that, uh, that didn't want to extend this tax break, um, even though the majority of his caucus did. So uh, he'll have to explain why that wasn't a good idea to help support aerospace cluster jobs here. But I think this, this was a bill and it shows where government can provide appropriate incentive to support very important industries in the state. One of the, one of the things I think was negative towards business and I think demonstrates a, a bad direction the legislature seems to want to go in. Uh, and that was, uh, that was House Bill, let me make sure I get it right here, I'm gonna look at my paper here, it was, uh, or I'm sorry, Senate Bill, Let's see here. I don't have, I think I have the wrong citation. Anyway, it was a Senate bill where the legislature decided they wanted to dictate the composition of boards at public companies. So I'm sorry, was, but your time is up. Okay. Well, then that's, that's good enough. I'll have to look it up and get it to you. But that was a bad, bad piece of legislation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Um, so, Ken, back to you. Um, Typically, 80% of the jobs in any given city are from small business. Most have been severely impacted to, or forced to close their doors as a result of this pandemic. What changes, if any, do you see need to happen to support our economy coming out of this recession? Thanks. I feel like I'm filibustering here a little bit, so. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I'm a small businessman, so I mean, I'm, I'm into this every day, and I see the things that business owners and people that are trying to hire employees go through. 
Um, I mean, some of the changes I've mentioned before, I, I think we need to look at either a B&O tax holiday short term or um, increasing the credit for small businesses for B&O taxes. I think that's something that can be done immediately. I don't think it will cost that much revenue and can really provide a boost. The, the other common sense things are just doing some things like the fact that you have to file with about five or six different state agencies to hire an employee. And, and so while Secure Access Washington, the portal has gotten better, it's still not where it should be. You should be able as an employer to go to one online portal for the state because it's all the same information and, and be able to hire that employee. Right now it's very cumbersome, it takes a long time. Um, and there's been suggestions of expanding this bad system to an eventual payroll tax where they'll do it just like they do the premiums for family medical leave. And this system is extremely cumbersome for an employer. You don't even know how much you owe the government when you file your quarterly return. You gotta go back and see what they actually require you to pay. So these are the kind of things when I talk about friction in the economy that prevent businesses from kind of coming back off the sidelines, rehiring employees, and starting to grow. And I mentioned before, another thing I'd like to see too is looking at licensing requirements, um, especially for jobs that may tend to be a little bit lower wage. So we can encourage workers to become business owners and build wealth. And, and I think if we can implement any of those policies, small business will be in a much better position. Thank you, Ken. Bill. Thank you, Rob. So I think one of the biggest changes we need to make is, is how we set protocols for, by, for businesses. You know, when this COVID first hit, it decided, uh, it, we didn't really have uh, everything down pat, but they took businesses by sector and set protocols or restricted things and so forth. And that's just too broad of a category for me. Within a sector, you can have things of very different nature, right? So we need to set up protocols that work for this particular business that is working. So example, retail, you say retail, well, that could be one person having a little store to a big box store, right? It's a different protocol. A service team could be one person, a three person crew, a 10 person crew. They could all work differently in the same business. So we need to look at each business individually, not as a sector, and, set, and once we set those protocols set on masking and keeping social distance and anything else needed, we can put them in place. And guess what? Small businesses are best at making changes, being creative and adaptive and doing what needs to be done. So give them that ability to do that and, and, and get to work safely. That's what's most important. People, I said it before, they want to work, they want to live. They, they, there's more that unites us than not in getting through this. So we can do it together. And so our, the simple thing is buy business individually, set protocols and let creativity take place so it, it can happen versus big blanket uh, requirements by sector. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, hey, Bill, what concerns you most as a citizen and resident of, a, of Washington State about the lingering impacts of COVID-19? Um, sorry, uh, what concerns me most, it, it's health. I mean, bluntly, that the most important thing to me are, are the people in our, in uh, here. And we must get this safe to work, save lives and keep people healthy. And then it's our business health because without business, it doesn't matter how healthy we are. We won't have the jobs. We won't have everything to live what we want. So it's personal health and then business health. And to get that, I mentioned earlier from the beginning, we got to have to get our health in check. And it's looking like we're going the right way now and we can, we can get there and then our businesses can ex expand and, and uh, work as they need to be. The concern also has a loss of those very small businesses. You know, I mean, call business, there's business to me or everybody from the independent owner operator to the one person shop to the five, 10, 20, 50 person people. I to me small business not the big businesses, those ones that are critical and getting taken care of them. And I'm afraid we're gonna lose some of those. And if we really lose them when we never get them back, that's a critical loss to our community. These folks are our family, they're our friends, they're our neighbors. And, and we wanna to work together to get that. I understand this issue. Those businesses are critical to keep them 
uh, give them the ability to weather the storm. So they stay there. So our small community stores are there. Remember this district is small town with all that rural and uh, uh, unincorporated area in between. It all ties together. It's critical how we all work and shop and play together. We have to do that and those things are critical. It's not like the big stores in other places. These small businesses are critical to our cities. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> Ken. Yeah, yeah I, I think, I mean, there's really two, two main things that concern me coming out of the crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one is, is that I believe that our, our children have really been uh, left behind by the fact that we, we've had to go to this remote learning situation now, you know, for, you know, six, nine months or whatever. And there's, we don't, we don't really see a clear path coming out of it. I, I had hoped that because K through 12 education was the paramount duty of the, of the state and the government, that the governor would have prioritized getting our kids back to in-person learning because this is going to affect, you know, it, it, as Bill talks about social justice, the people who are hurting the most are the, the least among us. And I, I don't know that how we're going to get them caught up. And, and that concerns me greatly. And I, I want to do everything we can to get our kids safely back in the classroom to learn. The, the other thing I'm concerned about is, is if we continue with a supermajority uh, run by the Democrats in the legislature, the COVID-19 crisis is going to be used as the bludgeon for everything that they want to get through. Got, got to raise taxes because of COVID-19. Got to regulate this industry because of COVID-19. The governor, governor's already talking about got to have climate change regulation because of COVID-19. Everything, everything that the Democrats want to do with their agenda is now all going to go back to COVID-19. And, and it concerns me that, that it's going to be used to forward an agenda that's not going to be good for our families and our businesses. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I think it's good to have a little bit of pushback in Olympia. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Um, this is the very last question. And uh, Joan and I kind of brainstormed this and we're still doing okay. So because it's an open-ended question, we wanted to give everybody up to three minutes because you may want to expand a little bit. Um, so, First of all, Ken, it's going to go to you. Um, and if you'd like to speak, we'd like to have you speak directly to the business community. Uh, what would you like to share that maybe we should have asked you during this interview, but we did not? That is a good question. Um, I mean, we, we always cover a wide range of subjects in, uh, in, in these forums and through these question and answer sessions. I mean, again, I, I think I've made it clear that, that I am part of this business community in the 5th District um, and that I, I have a very good understanding um, of, of what the challenges are of the incentives that government can provide to business and the burden and implements they can place in front of them. You know, but I, I think maybe one of the things is to talk a little bit more, you know, about kind of the human side and, and how that relates. Um, you know, I, I believe that business is the greatest creator of wealth other than owning a house. And, and that's why, you know, I believe we need to have an environment that fosters people to number one, believe that they can be entrepreneurs and start their own business and then offer them programs and training to help get them to that point. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I've done a lot of volunteer work uh, where I've tried to support youth, especially minority youth, as I volunteered in Big Brothers and Big Sister, to kind of look beyond what some people are kind of shown as their own limitations, whether it's through a bad public school system or kind of their own circumstances in their upbringing and try to expand horizons to say, hey, there, there's always a better way forward and that everybody has the potential to achieve these dreams. Um, I also serve as the treasurer of a nonprofit for the Scleroderma Foundation. Uh, so I have a, a deep understanding of, of healthcare and of disabilities and chronic illness because I cared for my late wife for nine years. And, and so I bring, you know, people think us, you know, Republican businessman, you know, very cold and everything, but I bring a very deep human aspect of my life that I will bring with me to this office because I believe we can move forward, we can advance the prosperity of everybody in the state 
and we can still take care of the most vulnerable among us in doing so. And, and so I guess that's one thing that I want people to understand about me is, is I bring compassion and life experience along with what I believe are common sense ideas that I've learned uh, as in the private sector and as a businessman. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And Bill, to you. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna go back to my initial um, uh, slogan from 2018. There's more that unites us than not. And I truly believe that and that we can work together always. I have been a business member uh, since as long as I've been in King County, uh, since the 80s. I have been a member of the Snoqualmie Valley Chamber uh, and active when I was there and now a member of your Issaquah Chamber, our Issaquah Chamber. And, and to work there and be part of that, always having a sense of that uh, on the Economic Vitality Commission as well. So, and I've been, my businesses, I mentioned before, uh, uh, as a landlord in rental business, I've been uh, a dance, had a dance studio, I have a consulting business, I've had a woodworking business. I've done a lot of small businesses that, that are interested in the community and keeping something happening. And, but what really counts in this thing is experience and, and knowing how to get the job done. I've got that from the, if you look at this Seattle Times endorsement, it's what people say about you that matters, not just what you say about yourself. Seattle Times resounding endorsement is the most qualified candidate for this office. And they've seen the work I've done for the last two years. They continue to support it because I work hard and I listen to folks. I'll continue to do that always. Other folks that endorsed me, besides uh, uh, Seattle Times, firefighters, teachers, environmental groups, retirees, elected officials are in, in our district, city mayors, city council folks, even folks that didn't support me before, support me now because after two years, they've seen the job I've done and they've changed their mind and said, yes, we can support you, even if you're a Democrat. <laughs> so that's pretty good. I'll listen and work with you. Our seven cities need that work. Our groups need that work. I'll meet with all the groups I do, uh, like I did with the chamber before last session. You present your legislative priorities to uh, uh, your legislators. My other seat mate and senator, we get together, we talk about those. It gives us the ability to work on those together. I worked on, on transportation, which is critical piece here. I'm working on that transportation package for our district as well as the state. I'm, I'm working on policing and policy leadership reform. And that's another thing on the social justice side I'm leading on trying to help us improve law enforcement, working with law enforcement, not away from them, not talking bad about them, bringing them to the table and say, what can you do? What can we do together to make this better? They acknowledge there's problems in, in law enforcement and they want to work to, them, to improve them. We can do that. You all know me. You all have my cell phone number. You can call me anytime. I am supported by so many people. You all know me. We talk and when we see each other on the street, you know it, you can call me. I'm out there having town halls or just wandering around. I'm accessible all the time. Um, so please uh, just consider that. I've done the talk, I've, I've done the work. I've not just talked it and I'll continue. Thank you. To... Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, kind of in closing and just a reminder and then Kathy will help us close too. Uh, thank you, Joan, for being over there in the left-hand corner. I don't know if you're, she's in the left-hand corner of all of us, but. I see your smiling face over there. <laughs> um, and next time we do this, I'll make sure I catch the coin. I'm at a table here, but I was a little bit of uh, disabled here at the moment, but not forever. Um, anyway, we should get a copy of this so that we can actually manage this to constituents or wherever. Um, any, any last things to say? Oh, you're muted. Wrong way. Okay, thank you. I thought I unmuted myself and I muted myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd just like to say on behalf of the Greater Issaquah Chamber, we'd like to thank our incumbent Bill Ramos and our candidate Ken Manitsky for joining us, allowing us to record this, to share it out with our membership. It's really important to us that businesses um, have an opportunity to hear from the candidates. Um, it's a different perspective. You know, we sit at home and we listen with one hat 
and we come to work and we listen with another. So I appreciate all the time you're spending out there on the campaign trail, uh, doing so many of these um, interviews and the Greater Issaquah Chamber certainly appreciates your time today. Um, our board of directors will get back to me if they decide to take any actions other than sharing with us our um, this recording with our membership and we will keep you posted on that. So just thank you again. Real quick. Yes, Ken. Will you make will you make our contact information available to your membership as part of this program or is, or how I mean can we give a website or email or what do you do you have do we have an opportunity to do that here or how would you like to proceed sure. with that? Um that's that's a great question. Um uh I'm sure we will one way or the other. Um, I know that government affairs um, on every single one of their agendas, they have your contact information. <laughs> I mean, since they all have Bill's phone number, I just want to make sure they can at least get to <laughs> we my website, right? Okay. <laughs> and, and in fact, why don't you do this real quick before we get off the line? Why don't the two of you put your contact information into the chat? And that assures that I have been given your permission to share it. So how about we do that? Just go into your chat box. Yep. and type your um, contact information that you would like me to share. And that will signify the permission I have to share it. Okay. All right. I've got both of you now. That's excellent. Again, Ken, Bill, thank you very, very much for your time today. We truly appreciate it. And I'm yeah, going to stop the recording much. now. Thank you again. Be All safe, right. everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, thank Mike. You.